G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Cade McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host of the show, Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? Uh, never better as per usual mate. It's a lot easier to be happy and joyful and excited and eager to discuss footy when the Blue Baggers have gotten a win <laughs> over their arch rivals on the weekend. So I'm feeling grouse. How are you feeling mate? How is it going up in the beautiful Geelong territory? Yeah, it's quite a wet and gloomy and bloomy kind of day, but uh, my spirits are high. It's one of the first times I've woken up sub 8 a.m. Um, for a long time. So, Did you, um, did you get a bit of brekkie in here? Did you have a superfood smoothie, perhaps? Yeah, I went cornflakes, which was, um, which uh, was lovely. good. Lovely. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's the new kale, kale super smoothie is what I've heard. It's a cornflakes. So you're doing well there. Well, we were talking about my diet a little bit earlier. I bought bacon yesterday and I'm eyeing off a bit of a full English breakfast <laughs> <laughs> for lunch. So I don't know where that sits. There is some greens with some avo and maybe some tomatoes, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter what you've got on the plate, mate. You could have three bacon and egg McMuffins and some baked beans and hash browns. As long as you've got that little quarter of avocado on the plate, yeah, it's, a, it's a healthy meal as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. That little patch of um, soggy spinach changes the, 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 whole, the, whole, calorie, <laughs> the whole calorie deficit of the, uh, of the dish. All right, Rog, we'll kick off things and we're going to go from the top and uh, we're going to go with the headline, which is... It's it's about time we've got a, a positive blues headline, but you're going to kick us off with the headline. Uh, yes, and I wanted to think of something clever and witty, perhaps some alliteration, maybe even a rhyme, but I thought not this time. We don't need it because uh, this man does all the talking just with his own football. So the, today's headline is Sam Walsh, full stop. Um I've refrained from uh, talking about Carlton the last few weeks, partially because we've gotten feedback that we talk about Carlton and Melbourne far too much, and mainly because we got wins over sort of Adelaide and these sorts of teams. And I was like, I want to wait until um, a more impressive win until I delve fully deep into the Blue Baggers. Now, we beat the Pipes, who are far from a top eight outfit. In fact, they're closer to a bottom four outfit. (laughs) But... They are the arch rivals, and for some reason, I was texting you during the game, McDonald. Yep. And I was, I was that. Um, th- it was the most emotionally invested I'd been in a game by far all season. I've gotten a bit numb to Carlton, so when we're being disappointing, I usually laugh about it. I'll be texting me mates, and it's, it's like. I'm so used. And, you can go and to, you, you can sort of dismiss the emotion of the result and sort of distance yourself from it and not invest as much when your team's sort of down and out. Correct. But for some reason this week, it was like, it felt like it was a grand final. This is how much I wanted this win. Yep. Um, and it, I, I, I can't explain to you how angry I was at halftime. It was just about the worst half we played. But then enter Sam Walsh. And I, I'm surprised this hasn't been talked about more uh, over the past couple of days. Um, Sam Walsh has been talked about plenty and Jack Savani has been talked about plenty. But we were dead and gone for all money. Looked like the worst team in the competition. And then Jack Silvani kicked a goal after a big mark at the top of the square, pointed to his uh, to the skies for his late granddad and former club great Sergio Silvani, and everyone rushed to him, got around him, and like gave him the big pat on the back. And that was the turning point. Yeah. Right then and there, after that was when you saw the effort. It's like everyone realised how much this meant to this football club and this family. And it's a shame it took that for the boys to wake up. But then we charged out the pies. We kicked six goals in the last quarter, looked like millionaires. And Sam Walsh, um, I want to get your thoughts on what you think his ceiling is, where if he fulfills his potential, I'm not sure if he had the same potential like it, what do you think he will become? Uh, it will become one of the best Carlton players to ever play. Um and I think interesting use of the word Carlton. Um, are you po- putting the ceiling on one of the greatest Carlton players to ever play, or do you think it, there's potential he could go down as literally one of the greatest of all time? Oh no, he will. Um, I, I think there's definitely potential for it. The way he's come onto the scene, um, he's just played like an AFL footballer from word go, and that doesn't happen often. And it's pretty tough. It, it's probably it, it sort of um, upped the standards of a lot of your other draft draftees around him because 
Um, your Paddy Dows and whatnot are developing like normal AFL players. They take one, two, three years to really get their body right and really find themselves being comfortable out in the middle of the MCG. And then Sam Walsh rocks up and plays like Paddy Cripps from his first season and it puts the pressure on the other players. But it also probably brings them up a level. They're probably working harder. They're probably developing quicker with a player like him around him. Um, so, no, I do reckon he's, yeah, there's definitely brown lows. There's definitely some silverware coming for Sam Walsh. And um, if if he can't get a flag at the Blues, <laughs> I don't know who will. So um, it, it's, it's starting to turn and you're getting a, a really solid back half of the season, which is what you need. And hopefully if finals do or don't happen, um, this back end of the season can really set up the momentum for a real finals push for next year. Yeah, he's uh, already taken the mark of the year, Sammy Walsh, and he's kicked a couple of ripping... Yeah, he's not far t- off goal of the year as well. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. He's not far off the goal of the year. He's not far <laughs> off the brown, though. And I think he could just be the complete package. I've never seen anyone that just understands football the way he does. Like, you know, obviously I'm not the Messiah of football, so I'm not sitting here um, analysing every player going, oh, you do understand football or you don't understand football. Yeah. But e- everything he does, I go, you've picked the best option. I don't know how every single yeah. time you touch the ball, there will be times where I'll go, why hasn't he kicked it long there? And he holds on to it that extra five seconds and bang, the handball release into space and now the game's broken wide open. So uh, he was fantastic. Jack Silvani, I'm glad that he's f- finally starting to get the uh, recognition he deserves because if you ask any Carlton supporter, they would have told you over the past couple of years, he is a player and he is vital to our team, yet continually the footy public seems to slate him just because of mm. his surname. Yep. Um, but another question I have for you, Dossie, out of that game is uh, gr- everyone looked at the Ruckman and the midfield set up and a lot of people tip Collingwood on the back of that. Uh, Jonathan Brown spoke about it before the game started. He said you have Grundy tapping it down the throat of blokes like Pendlebury, Adams, Dugowie. This is a an A-grade elite midfield. This is a, a, a premiership winning midfield, really. Um, up against DeConning, young and developing. And then the backup for him in the ruck is Jack Silvani. Brady Grundy's backup was Darcy Cameron, a recognised ruckman. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, DeConning and Soss tapping it down to Walsh, who's obviously a freak. But then Dow, Matt Kennedy, who's one of my favourite players, but to the rest of the football world, a relative unknown. Yep. Dow, Kennedy, uh, and, you know, your Petrovsky, Satans and Fish is going through there. And people thought, how could we, Carlton, possibly win this game? Um, Grundy up against DeConning, and yet we won the clearances by over 20, I believe it was. Wow. So my, my question to you is... Are Ruckman overrated? You know, Grundy, the quite possibly the highest paid Ruckman in the game, one of the best, probably second or third behind Gordon Darcy. Uh, yet we've just gone ahead and won the clearances by 20 odds. So what, what's your interpretation of that? Um, well, uh, Nathan Buckley at the start of the year said hit outs are irrelevant. And it's a very true statement. Um, I don't think a Ruckman's dominance is just on hitouts. Obviously when they, you know, get fifty odd hitouts, it looks good on the stat sheet. But to me, Ruckman are really important with their marking and their ability around the ground. And obviously uh like a Grundy uh brings more that follow up and an extra midfielder type game. But um it, it's quite funny you bring that up because AFL midfields are so like you're splitting hairs of the ability of AFL midfields. Um, and I've seen it a little bit this year watching the Ds. Like, we have a stacked midfield. Gorn, Oliver, Petrarca, Viney starting in the guts. And we'll lose clearances to, you know, lesser light midfields weekly. So, um, it, it's quite funny that, yeah, you, you line the Collingwood and Carlton midfields up. And the Collingwood seems a little bit more established. But AFL midfields, you're splitting hairs with them. And it's all about, uh, it's not about the names. It's just about cracking in on the day um, and winning that contested footy, really. so um, Yeah, well, it used to be, the story used to be you win the midfield battle, you win the game. That's sort of where the whole conversation was. If you win the clearances and the stoppages, then um, you've got a long way to win the game of football. But now it seems to be more about rebound 50s, turnovers. Uh, the midfield battle is seemingly starting to matter a little bit Less and less, so to speak. Um, it's more the spread away from the stoppage. But, 
Yeah, uh, I'm wrapped with the blue bag. It's good to get a win over the arch rivals. And now since the review has started um, for the whole club, but, you know, it seems like the microscope was on David Teague. We've won three out of four. Um, mm. And we've got North this week. So, you know, if, if we happen to be that, which you would suspect we should, even though North are playing good footy, all of a sudden it's four from five. And it's a really exciting back half of the season uh, to launch ourselves into a big 2022 with a fully fit Charlie Curnow, a couple of extra recruits and uh, a fully fit list. Hopefully we can finally see that charge up the ladder, although I've been saying that for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, well, success doesn't seem like it's too far away for the Blue Boys, uh, which is good to see. Um, yeah, as you said, good back half of the year and um, hopefully launch the start of next year. But a team that's been spoiled for success over the last few years is the Richmond Footy Club. Um, I said, like, we broke the news. We broke the news to the <laughs> AFL world that the dynasty was done. And then it took a couple of weeks and, <laughs> and the AFL media jumped on board. And then I don't know if I've said it on this show. I've definitely said it on live streams or just um, chatting to mates off, off the, off the record, down at the pub. But I, I, I have stated that the Tigers won't make finals from here. And then a couple of days later, they go up and face a top four rampant Brisbane Lions and do an absolute number on them. So uh, it did make me second guess. Like once they, after that game, I looked at that 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 match and I thought, geez, the Tigers are a finals team. Like who, who am I kidding? Why have I written them off? But it's come as a, at, at a cost. They've lost Dusty Martin, um, and it makes their run even harder. Where do you see the Tigers at at the minute? Well, Gary Lyon was red hot on this, and there is pretty much no man in uh, the business's opinion I respect more than him, other than yourself, obviously, McDonald. Uh, <laughs> and he said the key to Richmond making a charge to the finals is accepting that they're not a great team right now as it stands. Um yeah. Because they kept on having this front in the media of you wouldn't want to play us in the back half of the season. You know, we are uh, the unstoppable force uh, and yeah. you will see that soon. But he was like, no, you're not. At the moment, you're outside the eight. The moment you accept that we are a bottom half of the table side as it stands um, and you go, all right, we need to get back to the high pressure, high octane team we were for the last four years. Mm. That's when you'll see your charge up the ladder. But while you keep on thinking that it'll just happen, it won't just happen. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like they finally accepted that, Jesus, we do need to get back to that unbelievable extreme pressure rating to be the Richmond of old. And they did that. Uh, but it, of course, uh, came at a cost, um, with that cost being... Dustin Martin and, to a lesser extent, Camden McIntosh. But, of yep. course, the whole conversation is around Dusty. And the irony is unbelievable. You know, Richmond, for the past four years, have been notorious for their lack of injuries, um, their clean bill of health. Dustin Martin, uh, I saw on, on the couch last night, He, I think he's played, it's some ridiculous stat, like his, since his debut, he's played 240 of a possible 248 games or something yeah. like that, yeah. uh, which is extraordinary for a man as bash and crash and physical as him. Uh, so it's funny that the one year that they're starting to struggle is the one year the injuries have come in. I don't think it's a coincidence. And... Uh, can they mount a finals charge without the best finals player we have ever seen, the three-time Norm Smith medalist <laughs> Dustin Martin? I'm I'm unsure, even for Richmond standards. I ruled them out uh, a week ago with the finals. I, they were sitting in 12th. They've got a hard run home. They were just showing nothing, like losing to St Kilda, losing to Collingwood, losing to all these bottom-rung sides. They were just in, in the position that they were in. They were just showing nothing that resembled the Richmond Football Club. And I, I wasn't ruling them out in terms of they can't bounce back next year because I think a fully fit Tigers, full pre-season, um, they can, they're can they still young enough to, to do it again. But at next, this year, next year, they'll be in my top four, I think, when I do my ladder prediction at the 100%. start. I, re I really think I'll have them in my top four. Yeah, and I, I will too. But to look at where they're at at the minute and still give them the benefit of the doubt, I think is fair because they've got runs on the board, but also you're not really viewing it in the brackets of this season. Like, if it was any other team, if it wasn't Richmond, you'd be going, oh, this 12th side is very average. Um, yeah. So I was, I was prepared to rule them out for the flag, and I'm prepared to rule them out for the finals. And once they won on the weekend, it did make me second guess 
a little bit, but I still think with Martin out, the mountain is too high to climb. But as we've spoken about off the record, it does build for the greatest story of all time. Well, I think the biggest, as Gary Lyon was referencing, like their biggest issue wasn't um, the the personnel per se and it wasn't the the coaching or anything like that. It was just like the, the mentality and the motivation where they, they thought that they were the duck's guts and then um, mm. it took them to realise they weren't the duck's guts for them to step up. And now I think with Dustin out, it multiplies that by a thousand and now they'll go, all right, we haven't got Dusty. The only way possible we will win the fi- we will make finals and then who knows produce a miracle is if we play the most Richmond brand of footy we've ever played in yeah. four years. Yeah. And I think that don't get me wrong, you'd might rather Dustin Martin in the side goes without saying, uh, but that could spark a fire in the belly. It, that's their motivation. When you win three flags in four years, it can potentially be hard to not hard to find motivation to win another flag. You'll always have motivation, but. To have more motivation than a side that hasn't won a flag in 40 years, yeah. uh, it, it, that that might be the struggle. But now that they're there going, right, we haven't got Dustin Martin, we haven't got key players, a lot of them are out. And if we do make finals and if we do win the flag, that will cement us as the greatest team of all time because people have always said, people have said rightfully or wrongfully, uh, rightly or wrongly, I should say, uh, no Dusty, no Richmond. They think that they wouldn't have won these three grand finals if it wasn't for Dustin Martin. Yep. So now they have that motivation to go, let's prove them wrong. From 12th on the ladder, everyone wrote us off. Let's play Richmond brand of footy for the last four games, five games, work our way into the finals and win the most improbable grand final and produce probably one of the greatest footy stories of all time and the greatest football team of all time. It would be, yeah, unbelievable. It would absolutely be one of the greatest teams to do it and I still think if they make the finals and get to a semi final or even a prelim, I still think that helps build this dynasty. Like I think if they drop off miss finals for this year, it feels like the dynasty's starting again if they do have success next year. But if they make finals and compete, it still looks pretty good in that run of form. It sort of goes flag, flag, prelim, flag, you know, it sort of yep. looks quite good still. Uh, well, your, you, uh, your side's one of the handful of contenders, um, so uh, no better man to ask. If the Ds were to play in a semi-final or a prelim, uh, would you rather play Richmond at the G or would you rather be playing a Port Adelaide or a Brisbane, do you reckon? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely uh, a Port Adelaide. Like I'd, This will come back to bite me at some stage, but I'd lick my lips at a Port Adelaide you know, semi-final, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, look, I've sort of been quite confident all year that this Tiger side that I've been looking at, it doesn't worry me as much as it should. But after they knocked off Brisbane, it's made me sort of uh, sort of reevaluate how I feel about them, and they are still dangerous. Um, yep. So, yeah, I'd definitely rather not verse them than verse them. That uh, Brisbane loss made a lot of people reevaluate Brisbane standing in. F- Premiership contention, but the Demons draw to Hawthorne has cast a curious eye over the whole competition because uh, you you do it once and it's a blip on the radar. You do it twice, it raises his eyebrows, but you do it three times and it starts to be a worry, I think. And the Demons have uh, unfortunately failed against three of the bottom sides and yet continue to succeed against the best sides in the competition. <laughs> One of the weirder sort of <laughs> nuances I've ever seen in a football team throughout a season. Yeah. Where do you th- where where does the draw with Hawthorne leave you uh, thinking about the D's in terms of premiership calculations? Well, we were lauding the praises of the D's during the year, and you were uh, trying to rip the lid off at round six and <laughs> trying to uh, really get me excited. And I was very um, conservative with my excitement because. The D's will let you down in the most random of ways. I've never seen a team on top of the ladder drop points to 16th, 17th and 18th. It Well, or 15th, 16th and 17th. I think we beat North. Um, it, it just doesn't happen. Like, you don't see a top team do that. Um, so it's the most Melbourne thing I've ever seen. And it's come to like to no surprise. I had mates, I think Dill texted me, you texted me. Um, geez, D's win by 12 goals tonight. 
and I go, oh, I hope so. Like, oh, geez, oh, I really do, you know, fingers crossed, but I'm not sure about it. Um, and it was the most Melbourne performance I've, I've, I've ever seen. Where We didn't get out of, like, the first quarter and a half was good. Didn't get out of second gear after that, and we still drew. It's just bizarre. I, I, I've never seen a, a team on top of the ladder um, do this before. Did you watch On the Couch last night? I watched the Melbourne part. Yeah, well, I haven't heard a better explanation of what the hell is happening with Melbourne uh, from anyone other than Gary Lyon. Gary Lyon's explanation finally started to make sense because yeah. people were questioning if it was your mentality. And I'm sitting there going, surely, you know, I understand. I've been saying that I understand for a game during the season, you've just come off beating a couple of the top sides. You might be a bit mentally and physically buggered. Then you come out and uh, you play a poor team like a Hawthorne. I can understand why you might switch off that 10%. You might not be at full capacity and that could be enough to let them in. But when it happens three times in the season, I'm starting to think surely it can't happen three times where you just rock up to a game and you, and you haven't turned up. Yep. That doesn't make sense to me, especially when, you haven't, when you're a club who hasn't really achieved it, anything. Um, maybe with the Richmond it could make some, a bit more sense. But with yeah. the Demons, how could you not have that fire in the belly to cement top spot and give yourself the best chance of winning finals. But then Gary Lyon came out and said he doesn't reckon it's a you thing per se, but it's more an oppositional thing because when you play the top teams like a Geelong or a Brisbane, they back in their own structures. They back in their own ball winning and match winning abilities to get them over the line. And then when it's Geelong's best footy up against Melbourne's best footy, Melbourne, you still have the best football in the league, so your football wins out. But then when you play the bottom teams, they know that their f- best football won't hold up against your best football. So yep. instead, their mentality is let's shut down Melbourne. Let's, let's, uh, let's minimise the impact of their most important players. And when they put focus all their attention on shutting you down, you do shut down, and that's how they've managed to beat or draw against you. And I think that explanation is by far the best I've heard so far. Well, that's 100% what happened against GWS. Um, I watched that game and we just got strangled for four quarters and we still almost won. Like it, we, And it's it's just bizarre because like halfway through the year, we were sitting on top um, and I felt like we'd played two or three good quarters in 10 games of football. So I, it's just, it's, it's a bizarre position. It's a bizarre position to be in. I don't think the Ds are going to finish first. I think we've got some hurdles to come. I just hope that we can stay in that top two. um, I think you do finish first because, like Gary said, when it's you against the top teams and each team backs in their own ability, you've proven without fail every single time this season that you will win because you play your brand of footy is the best (laughs) brand of footy in the league. So, But then the question that brings up leading into finals is if you are a Geelong or a Bulldogs or a Cats, um, say this week Melbourne comes out and beats the dogs, you've been beat them pretty comfortably like you did the last time. Then the dogs play you again in finals. Do they back in their own ability, their own structure, their own formula against your team? Or do they do what a Hawthorne and a Giants and whatnot have done and go, well, let's not back in our ability. Let's acknowledge Melbourne are the best team and let's shut them down. And they they uh, they sacrifice their own players uh, to shut down yours. Do you think that that's an option they would take? Or do you reckon grand final, Melbourne v the Cats or the Dogs, they back in their own ability and they go toe-to-toe with you, even though it hadn't worked once during the season? Well, it, it depends. See, I think a Geelong probably can back in their own ability. We haven't faced a Geelong fit and firing and really humming, which they are at the minute. So I'd be interested to see how that game play, uh, plays out at the end of the season. I think the Bulldogs, uh, this might come back to bite me on Saturday night, but I think the Bulldogs do need to adopt a Hawthorne or GWS tactic because I'm not sure whether that sort of Marvel champagne footy works against us. So I think if the Dogs keep attempting to do that, it'll just fall into our hands. So it'd be interesting to see what the Dogs do this week. It's probably a good test for them to go, um, yeah, maybe they back in their footy for this round and then, they might have to readjust in finals. But this is a massive game, and I'm absolutely gutted that I've never seen my team play in a, 
and a um, a, a top two clash in my life, and it's happened twice this season, and twice it's just happened when we can't go to the footy. So I'm a little bit gutted, but uh, absolutely that- uh, devastating. Just quickly, because we have got plenty uh, to talk about on the show for the remainder, uh, I think it'd be remiss of us not to discuss the other fallout from the Melbourne Hawthorne draw, which is the penalty shootout discussion. Uh, we put this on the agenda a few weeks ago, <laughs> McDonald. Um, no surprises they're talking about it now. Uh, where, and I can't believe the the people that I'm hearing talk about this. You expect this to come from people who perhaps just retired from the game, like your Dale Thomases and whatnot. But mm. this has been your Jason Dunstalls, your greatest goal kickers of the game, long retired from it, are suggesting a revolution in the way we interpret a draw in the AFL. And that would be a set shot penalty shootout. What, what are your thoughts on the set shot penalty shootout, McDonald? No, I don't really like it, to be honest. If anyone's played FIFA before, there's nothing more just empty feeling than going to penalties after a big clash. And, uh, yeah, either winning or losing, it doesn't feel like you've won or lost after a penalty shootout. So I think it would be a pretty hectic spectacle, but I'm not for the AFL penalties. But what are your thoughts on it, Rog? Well, uh I am a massive soccer fan, as you know. Love me Crystal Palace. Wake up at all hours of the morning to watch them. I flew to South London to watch them live. And I couldn't be any more anti-penalty shootouts in soccer because the game of soccer for 90 minutes requires so much skill. We're talking passing, shooting, tackling, blocking, a million different skills. So for that to be a draw at the end of 90 minutes and then what you're deciding that 90 minutes on, who 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 raises the cup, who raises the World Cup <laughs> is based on who can take a pot shot from th- five metres away without, <laughs> yeah. any, without any pressure from the opposition. Um, who can do that better five times? It seems wrong to me and it all, has always seemed unfair. Now, with AFL, it is a little bit different because we're talking a four, what they're suggesting is a set shot from 40 metres out straight in front. And the difference with that to soccer is in soccer – it is more likely than not for you to score the penalty. You're a world class player. You have a free. You have a spot kick from five meters away. You should be scoring that. Yep. With the AFL, a forty meter set shot out straight in front. As we know, uh, that's not far from a guarantee. In fact, it's almost a coin flip as mm. to whether that's going in or not. So it does take a bit more skill. But I still don't agree with it because footy takes so much. There's so many elements to it. There is contested ball, tackling, clearances, hit-outs from the Ruckman. There is uh, defending, spoiling. There's a million different aspects. So if that's drawn after two hours, all of those aspects, to then go, all right, how we're going to decide a victor is by who can kick five set shots better at the end, yep. um, seems a bit unfair. I think two points each side as per the draw yep. makes a bit makes a bit more sense than four points to one team and zero points for another uh, just on the back of who can take a set shot better. But uh, you go, mate. I was just going to say, I like it. I like the way the ladder looks after the draw. Um, there's a team in the – well, yeah, uh, GWS sitting in the race for the eight have the two-point extra, which throws a spanner in the works because um, obviously a team can jump that with a win, but it's almost enough to – it's almost well. It, it's almost a win in the well in the D's position in particular. Our draw is going to count as a win because if we were on even points with Geelong and Bulldogs, their margins, are, uh, their percentage is so much better than ours that it wouldn't really count for anything. But those two points um, are the thing that is keeping us up. Now, if they were to bring in a decider, they went, okay, we're not happy with the draw. We want more of a spectacle. We want someone to leave with four points. This is what we talked about weeks ago, and this is how I would do it if I was to be Gillen, in Gillen McLaughlin's seat. And I'll go, do, go run through it quickly because we've already spoken about it earlier in the uh, previous episode. You nominate uh, – it's, it's, a, it's a penalty uh, format, so five shots each team. Say Carlton are first, and we're going up against Brisbane. We nominate our, a kicker inside 50. So say we have Sam Walsh standing about 90 metres out from goal <laughs> and you nominate one forward. So we nominate Harry Mackay. And then the defending team nominates their defender. So they'll go Harris Andrews. And then uh, the umpire blows his whistle. It's Sam Walsh's job to deliver inside 50. If he M- Mackay marks it, beautiful, goes back, either kicks a goal or behind. But if he doesn't, the ball hits the deck or Harris Andrews spoils and... 
And the way that no score is counted is if there's a stoppage or a rebound 50. So yep. we nominate Mackay, Andrews, bang, ball up, then then it's dead, or Harris Andrews, big spoil outside the 50. Then next up, it's Brisbane's term, and they might nominate their attacker to be Charlie Cameron, and then we need to pick a small defender, so we put <laughs> Liam Stocker on him. Imagine the drama and how exciting <laughs> it would be to see a ball inside 50, and you've got Charlie Cameron in there, or Dustin Martin, or whoever wants to be, in a one-on-one contest, and that is more fair to decide a game of football, I think, because now we're not it. just... Now we're not just incorporating one small aspect of the game, which is a set shot. Now we've got a beautiful kick inside 50. You've got marking. You've got spoiling. You've got tackling. You've got goal kicking. Not just of a set shot, but of a snap of a banana on the run. You've got so many more aspects of the game. And that would sit a bit more comfortably with me if that's how a game of football was decided. Yeah, I don't mind it. That's very revolutionary. Um, Yeah, that would bring... So much excitement and pressure and intenseness. Imagine a final <laughs> decided by that. Oh, uh, like, and imagine, like, you know, Richmond nominates Dustin Martin. It's Brisbane. They nominate Mitch Robinson. And somehow Robinson manages to lay the tackle and the crowd erupts. <laughs> like, the crowd goes bananas. <laughs> Dusty's, Dusty's been stopped. It would be the most phenomenal viewing you've ever seen. I think that has a lot more entertainment value. It makes a lot more sense than uh, than uh, the straight shootout. And in fact, tomorrow morning, I'm going to ring Gary and Tim on SCN <laughs> and I'm going to hope to win a new car with the caller of the year. Roggy, you stated in previous episodes that the Bombers will make the eight and they have proven you correctly by winning and they are now currently in the eight and they've got one of the easier runs to finish off the season but um, pretty solid win over North. Yeah and I can't express how impressed I am with North Melbourne and we've said it before but yeah. um, for the team that was not meant to win a game all season for them to come out and you're seeing their start like the, for, at the start of the season I struggled to see their future even with their young players I was like is this a list yeah they might go okay they might make it the eight in a few years but is this a side that could really win a premiership especially considering that North Melbourne uh, infamously struggled to lure big fish but yeah. now I'm starting to think this is a team that could challenge. Uh, players like Taron Thomas and LDU is finally mm. really starting to stamp his authority and Simpkins going to work. And I'm starting to see uh, a depth of ta- young talent that could see them really challenge in a few years. So I love what North Melbourne are doing and I really do hope that they do big things in the few years. Uh, but Essendon, uh, we said it last week, so we won't go over it too much, but they were the team that were meant to be bottom four. They were the biggest doom and gloom team, I reckon, heading into this, other than Collingwood. Uh, They were probably the second biggest doom and gloom team. Um, And yet here they are in the eight. They lost quality footballers. They lost Saad. They lost Danaher. They lost Fantasia. And yet here they are... um, in the top eight. And Michael uh, Michael Allen, co-host of Drivel and long-time friend of the show, uh, said to me at the start of the year, he's an Essendon supporter, said, Rog, I honestly don't think it will be that big of a dilemma as what people say losing these players because we didn't have Danaher the past two, three years. Yep. Um, and we didn't have Fantasia the past two or three years. So, yes, losing Saad hurts. So we've only really, from the last two years, going off the 22 we've fielded on the park. We've lost side, but we've gained three first-round picks. So, yeah. you know, I don't think it'll be as a bigger drop-off as what people think. And me, I thought that's just typical one-eye supporter <laughs> chatter. I think um, that's you trying to find the optimism in the bleakest of darkness. But here they are in the top eight. He's proven me wrong. And they uh, – don't get me wrong, I don't think they're going to be winning grand finals. But – their best footy is so exciting. Archie Perkins is a dynamo in the Ford 50. He, yeah. he seems like the sort of player that will be that burst Dustin Martin type, um, Jake Stringer, you know, sort of can kick, a, can kick two, three goals in five minutes and change the, flip the game on its head. And uh, I just love love what they're doing. Heppel is starting to find some form again. And two meter Peter, the set shot king. I didn't. I actually <laughs> didn't realize until a few weeks ago that he was one of the best set shots in the league. I didn't have that knowledge, but here he is. He, he was a player that a lot of people wrote off before the season started. And it's like everything's starting to click into place. And hats off to Ben Rutten. He's one that's proven me wrong as well. I yeah. I, was, I was listening to Ben Rutten speak at the start of the season. And I thought, this isn't an eloquent man. This isn't someone who (laughs) I see as intelligent. Like, this is someone I think is a bit 
fucking, I imagine him to be in the rooms going, boys, kick it long, kick it long. <laughs> like, you know, no real smarts whatsoever. But here they are in the top eight and it turns out he probably does know what he's talking about. So as much as we potted the Essendon uh, faithful a couple of weeks ago, kudos to you, hats off to you. What a phenomenal side you're turning out to be and will be in the next few years. Yeah, and it makes that um, that race for the finals so, so exciting. Um, yeah, they're in a box seat to play in the finals. They, It's up to, like, it, it's it's in their control, which is where you want to be at this time of the year. But as we've seen, any team that sort of hits that seventh or eighth mark just seem to shit the bed. So it'll be really interesting to see whether Essendon can continue this great form and keep um, keep surprising everyone. Well, but it, it would be the most Essendon thing ever for them to show all this form and they've got the easy <laughs> run home. Then in the easy run home, they drop three games and finish 12th. <laughs> but they are in eighth. West Coast are in seventh with 30. They're a win above Essendon and Richmond and Fremantle and St Kilda. Do you think it's settled? Or do you see Richmond without Dustin Martin perhaps taking Essendon's or maybe even getting you know a couple wins on the board to, to knock off West Coast spot? Well, I don't, I don't think it's settled, no. I think there's like the amount of ridiculous things we've seen in the last uh, couple of weeks. I, I think we've, we're going to see a lot, more, um, a lot more changes and a lot more uh, just uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, well, one change, one change we did see is port into the four, which doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't seem like they're a top four <laughs> side. Uh, and Brisbane slide out. For whatever reason, I mean, the ladder doesn't really tend to lie, even though we do have a lopsided competition instead of fi- in terms of fixtures. Mm. But Port Adelaide fourth, Brisbane fifth. And it's not just on percentage, it's by four points, it's by game. Uh, do you think that's settled? Do you think Sydney, Sydney I think, might... Yeah, I, I think Sydney are a more of a top four side than Port Adelaide. Uh, I think Sydney are more of a top four side than Port Adelaide and Brisbane. I, I think if I'm playing... F- in the finals and the D's come up against Sydney, they're probably the team that worries me the most out of the top five at the minute. Um, they, they are just a hard, hungry footy side and their footy always stacks up. Um, it, it's a finals type type game plan. So the, the Swans are the team that I think probably deserve to be in the top four. I, I think Brisbane will probably get their shit together and naturally finish in the top four, but they are leaving the door open for Port Adelaide who, as we know, punish the bottom side. So they will get enough wins to put the pressure on the top four. The footage of Justin Long, Long, Longmire, Long, yep. yeah, Justin Longmire, yep. uh, was phenomenal. Now, we've talked about how Simon Goodwin and David T take the approach of it's not our job to get emotional. That's not – a coach's job is to watch the game, identify the flaws, identify what's going well um, – Encourage the team to keep on doing what they're doing well to do it more and yep. what they're doing wrong, instruct them how to do it better. It's not, an, they see it as not an emotional per se role. Um, that, that's not what's winning your premierships. But seeing Longmire's passion on the bench, seeing the footage of him before the game when Sydney and GWS went into chaos, they had players miss. <laughs> Three players who played the day before had to, on 20 minutes' notice, come in, put the Guernsey on, get yeah. their strapping done and run out there. The way he charged them up, turned it into a positive, and the fo- if you haven't seen the footage of the rooms, please go do it, uh, back pocket plugger faithful, because he rolled them up. The- they were popping. It wasn't like, a, oh, Jesus, panic mode, anxiety, what's going to happen? It was, you bloody ripper. Three players who weren't getting a game are now in the side. It's their chance to stamp a spot in for finals, and they were that excited. And when I see that and see the way he was coaching from the bench, it does make me go... Gee, I wish Tiki had a bit more of that in him. I know he has that point of view of let's just watch the game and uh, identify the issues and whatnot, but seeing that raw emotion, that old school sort of mentality of the coaching, Jay, I think that's doing massive for the Sydney Swans. Yeah, but it is. And the Swans, as we've said many times this year about the culture, just speaks volumes. You know, They dropped out of the eight for maybe one year and then they bob back up and they're a top four side. Um, so... It is very, very impressive, and they're, yeah, they're probably the how, team that's building the best. How many clubs are there that could have a player like Papley of that stature request a trade to an opposition club and not only convince him to stay 
for the short term, but for the long term and buy in and invest the way he did. You have players like, you know, Bryce Gibbs at Carlton, you know, I'm requesting a trade to Adelaide. The trade didn't get done, but the next year they leave. And that seems to be a theme at the moment. It's happened a couple times of late where um, if the trade doesn't get done, like Joe Danaher, it'll just get done the next year. But they have such a culture that the, a player, a A-grade footballer who requested a trade away, changes his mind and buys in completely. And he's the most passionate bloke out there on the field. So, yeah, can't speak volumes enough of their culture. And they they are the side that is building most of the back end of finals. And uh, I think that they, from a Melbourne's perspective, they might be the team that you least want to play uh, come September. Yeah, well, 100%. 100%. Um, they're a team who I think will take scalps. And I do see the Swans being in prelim weekend at this point in time. So uh, they are putting themselves in a position to do it again. And, and they're starting to uh, be more conversation around the Banyul boy. And I'm not talking about C. Rogers in the back pocket. I'm talking about Justin McInerney. Uh, another, you know, we've talked about him before, but he is doing massive things at the moment. And just another young player you're, um, that is improving at a rapid rate and fast-tracking their development. And if it was any other club, these players would take another three <laughs> years to develop and yeah. uh, it'd be a painful few years. But they just fast-track their development. Buddy's on fire. Uh, four goals in the second half, I think it was, and he's just going to steamroll his way to a 1,000. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's move on to our segment that ends every back pocket plugger show. It is the goals, the behinds and the out on the fools. We'll kick it off with the, the bad news. We'll kick it off with the out on the fools and I'll get yours first Roggy. I do like how we start with the out on the fools. There are a couple of other shows, uh, football shows that have you know a, a good, a bad and an ugly type set up and they start with the goods and I think why would you want to finish on the sour note? Let's finish on the positive. Yeah, and my out, my out in the full is Commentary in general, the AFL's commentary, but primarily Dermot Brereton's special comments. Um, it seems like the damn wall broke for the whole footy community at once. Because uh, this was the first week where I was so... I've always not been a fan of his commentary, but this was the first week where it really started to make watching footy unenjoyable and a bit frustrating. <laughs> and I went onto Facebook and all the comments said the same thing. So yep. I think it's been a build-up. Uh, I don't know if these blokes understand what you're meant to do, on commentary, he acts as if he's <laughs> a, a, the this the the guru of football, like the senior. He's like, like he's a senior coach of a side out there, and he's coaching the players as the game's on. That's not your job. Your job's to commentate what's happening. He's yeah. a special comments man that speaks more than the play by play. And if it was just commentary that I didn't find ideal, I wouldn't take so much time to pot him. But when it's making watching football legitimately unenjoyable, like I have to almost turn the audio off, then it's a genuine issue. You know, it's, you're ruining the game for me. So Dermot, you're on notice. Stop taking it as if this is your job audition to be the Maharaja of football and just comment, commentate on what's happening. You're not, uh, you're not the Messiah of football. I like it, Rog. Um, Dermy is in the gun, and it's about time. Um, I'm going to move on to my. I'm, su- out. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll be listening, and uh, <laughs> he'll take it to heart. Uh, my out on the full is jumper clashes. Now, I saw a guy on Twitter maybe three, two or three months ago talk about how in the EPL there's no ego about full blown alternate kits. It's not like uh, Manchester United needs to be red every week. They you know, they chuck on their white kit or their blue kit or there's some um, teams who are, you know, their their alternate kit is like a yellow. It's like a completely different colour. Crystal Palaces is a yellow. We're the red and blue team and our yeah. waist strip is a yellow kit. Yeah, and, and it's um, a completely different colour and it just makes not only the clash of the kits um, not an issue, but it just makes TV so much easier for that far away wide broadcast shot to be able to identify each team. And you can s- clearly see each team when it's like a, a yellow Crystal Palace kit versus a blue Chelsea. It's like you can see the distinction between the kits. Now, with the AFL, for us, uh, when we play, it's like the difference in kit is usually white shorts, potentially. And and yeah. some sometimes I'll look and it's like a... It's just the white shorts that'll be the difference. And there's no clear distinction between the full kit. And on the weekend, it was up there with the worst I've seen. It was obviously Collingwood versus Carlton. And that's 
probably the worst clash you're going to get all year. Um, yeah. And it, it doesn't happen week in, week out, but there was just clearly an overlapping of colours. And I don't know if this is the same issue, but Geelong I, and Collingwood a few years ago um, had this pact that Geelong would always wear white shorts, even at home games against the Pies, because Geelong just changing their shorts to white changes, even if they're the home team, changes their complete kit. It makes their socks look whiter. It makes their shirt look whiter. And the Pies keeping their shorts as black makes their whole kit look darker. And I wonder if that was something that could have been done for the Carlton and Collingwood clash. I'm not sure, but I think one of the great um, examples of the alternate kit was the week before, and it was the Blues and or a couple of weeks before, it was the Blues and Freo, and it was Freo in this dark purple, and then the Blues, instead of being in the dark blue and the white shorts, they were just in all white, and it made the TV aspect of it look so much better. So I think alternate kits, and not just jumpers, I think shorts. I think, like, if you've got a red alternate kit, you wear red shorts. I think full alternate colours um, is the way of the future. Well, from a marketing perspective, it would make the business, the, you know, the club so much money. When you have a funky, cool-looking away kit, all the kids love it generally because it looks real different and looks real uh, exciting. Uh, and it would be a chance for them to make some more money. And each year you look forward to the new away kit. I think it's a good idea. Um, my behind... Oh, by the way, my camera is cut out. So for those w- w- uh, watching on the YouTube, apologies. You won't get to see this beautiful back pocket plugger face for the remainder of the show. But for the podcast listeners... Uh, Never mind, business as usual. Uh, <laughs> my, my behind is the dangerous tackle debate. Uh, and the reason why it's behind is because I have two very conflicting opinions on it. Uh, the first is uh, when they go overboard, it's a pretty big blight on the game. You know, like tackling is such a difficult art to master and sometimes you can be asking a bit too much of the tackler. Uh, in When you're tackling someone as fit and as powerful as an AFL footballer is, you need to put every ounce of power and effort and might into that tackle as you can. So it's hard to ask them not to um, occasionally get them in weird positions when they're tackling. Uh, But the conflict to that is I feel like we've become a bit numb to the word concussion. Um, You hear concussion and, yeah, we all take it seriously, but we're probably not taking it as seriously as what we should be. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, I know, I know it's a different caper, but uh, I'll bring it back at the end. Uh, Chris Benoit in the wrestling took one too many che- chair shots. He got uh, CT, which is when the brain starts de- degenerating from too many concussions. And he ended up murdering his wife and kids. And I hate to bring that uh, mood down on the back pocket plug, plug a podcast. Murdered his wife, his kids and himself. Now, that is the potential we're talking about when you get too many concussions. And that might seem like I'm going massively overboard, but um, unfortunately we've had a situation in the AFL where as de- the most devastating of circumstance, Danny Frawley had CT. His brain was degenerating. Um, assume You can only assume from too many con- concussions playing football. And um, he, he unfortunately, uh, you know, took a turn for the worse. Uh, and, we, this is what we're dealing with here. You know, too many concussions can result in tragedy and we need to fully grasp that. And if there is two decisions per round that results in people going, oh, maybe that's a bit overboard, then yeah. I think that's a small price to pay for the devastating result that could uh, happen if you get too many concussions. So I think, you know, if, if you see a dangerous tackle, it's pay and you don't agree with it, don't be so quick to abuse the rules and abuse the umpires. Take a look at the greater picture and think maybe this is worthwhile for the greater good of the game. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Well said, Rog. I think a couple of those dangerous tackles had the mechanisms of the dangerous tackle and the action of it without the consequence. So I saw a couple on that Friday night game where the arm was pinned and the shoulder hit the grass. So it's sort of like that turning of the body, arm was pinned, shoulder has made contact with the grass and by all means looked dangerous. Like it looked like the ones that you see at the tribunal. It's just the guy didn't get concussed and the force wasn't so much where they do land on the head. So I felt like the calls were there, to be honest, even though the bloke gets up and goes, hey, I'm fine. As you said, I think it's better to be safe 
then sorry. Um, I reckon we whip through these last couple pretty quickly. Um, my behind is Dusty Martin. I think it's just a shame that one of the greats of the game isn't going to be playing and isn't going to be playing finals if the Tigers do make it. Um, so I think it was a little bit of a sour note on that Friday night game that Dusty Martin has got injured and injured to the extent that he is. Like He's a pretty private guy and they've kept things under wraps. It seems like he's going to be coming home in the next couple of days, but you just don't know and you don't want anything happening to your kidneys. We've seen tragedies with the AFL before, with Tom Lonigan and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, wishing Dusty Martin one of the best players to ever do it. All the best. Beautifully said. And my goal is uh, Jamara Ugelhagen. Not just his game uh, and his beautiful goal kicking, but the fact that he's using Brendan Favola's goal kicking technique. <laughs> One hand above the other, drops it with the underhand, kicked through the ball. It's a beautiful straight set shot, Favola style. We know that that's his... Uh, girlfriend's old man so they're spending a lot of time together and that just warms the heart to see you know the the future father-in-law uh great the, one of the greatest goal kickers the game's ever seen teaching the young gun number one full forward draft pick how to kick a football that warmed my heart mcdonald um geez i had a bit of egg on my face because i thought he was not ready to play footy he wasn't in form in the vfl he debuted against the swans and got an absolute bath and then he goes up to the gold coast and kicks three so um hats off to jamara to be honest, my goal for this week is so I I love young forwards like they young key forwards and the prospect of them like your Max Kings and whatnot. It gets me excited because I love seeing the potential of like a young key forward, and then I love seeing them develop into really good, um, you know, Coleman medalist uh, key forwards. And one that I think is going to overtake my other favourite player. So one of my favourite players is probably Oscar Allen, but I think this bloke has jumped him. Um, and it's Mitch Georgiatis. He is oh, so yes. exciting. Um, his hands are great. His set shot kicking, I think, is one of the best out of the up-and-coming young forwards. Um, he is unbelievable. He kicked four on the weekend against the Saints to get the power over the line. He took an absolute screamer on Gorney the week before and kept the Port Adelaide Footy Club in it in that third term. He is just developing really, really nicely in his second year. Well, Kane Corns, uh, I doubt that this is a biased opinion, but he's flagged <laughs> Georgiatis as uh, the rising star, and now that's what the conversation is. And if he is the winner, then he is full well deserving of it. So, well done, Mitchy Georgiatis, and keep on taking those aims. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Rog, that's it for another episode of the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure, mate. Fun as usual. Um, uh, we appreciate everyone who tuned in to the podcast on your iTunes and your Spotify. We appreciate everyone who tuned in on the YouTube. And we'll see you all next week to talk some more footy. Cheers. Keep plugging those back pockets.